talking about the research that Barbara Barthlick and I have been doing for the past, now going on six years together, since exploring my family's abduction experiences and encounters that my husband and I will be talking about tomorrow. I'd like to define four terms the way I'm going to be using them. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and if y'all please bear with me, I've had less than five hours sleep, I've been on a plane for two days, and I just got here, so if I don't look uh, calm and relaxed, guess what? I'll get better as we go along. First term, abduction. There's a lot of controversy about political correctness and terminology dealing with the interaction of aliens and humans, and I have no qualms about saying I use the term abduction because it's the most specifically correct term for what I'm describing. An abduction, in my definition, is the forcible removal and control of a human from his or her normal environment. That's what I mean when I say abduction, nothing else. Contact, encounter between human and alien in which there is no forcible removal, although there is always control during the encounter of the human by the alien, and often involves the delivery of information or a message, and may or may not be with the human physically viewing or in the physical presence of the alien. So I use these two terms as separate experiences and within the contact experience there are a variety of subdivisions we'll get into if we have time a little bit later. The second pair of terms I want to define are positive and negative. Again, we've been cautioned by many people that we shouldn't even be thinking in terms of positive and negative and I find this to be total BS. Anything that relates to human concerns, we have to consider implications for these things. And certainly anything as profound and as unnerving and as totally foreign, I don't want to say alien, that seems to be repetitious, to our experiences as the contact with a non-human species must have implications. It's not an accident and it has consequences and certainly there's an agenda. So when I use the term positive and negative, I'm referring to those things positive which are constructive to human concerns. Negative are those things that are detrimental to human concerns. I'm a human and I'm concerned. We have the whole chandelier shaking above you as you're speaking about it. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the audience is getting rescued. Are we back on? Okay. Okay. How's that? All right, did everybody get what I said on positive and negative? Anybody want that repeated? All right. How about abduction and, abduction and contact? We're okay there. Okay. Positive, those things that are constructive to human concerns. Negative, those things that are detrimental to human concerns. And if you're not concerned whether this, these contacts are positive or negative to human concerns, then you and I are from different planets, and so we may have a problem with communication. Now, a lot of the major researchers say don't talk in these terms, let's simply look, let's simply examine data, and not be concerned about what agenda may be behind these contacts and abductions, and that's just not where I come from, so you're free to disagree, and, and I think that's what makes this work very exciting. But I think we must, in fact, answer one question more than any other, and that is, what is the agenda, what is the motivation behind any of these contacts or abductions? What are the aliens here for? Until we know what that agenda concerns, we don't know how to react. We can be fools and we can be wise men, but we will not have a clue until we understand what is behind the agenda. And right now, without fully examining all of the data, not the sensory partial reports that we so often get secondhand and thirdhand about abduction and contact experiences, you can't make any decisions. And I'm not going to take upon myself the paternalistic or maternalistic role of trying to decide what you can handle knowing and what you cannot. I'm not going to censor or limit my information, nor am I going to try to judge it. I simply want to present it. And I think we're all intelligent enough to look at the data firsthand and make our own assessment. <clears throat> now, a problem right now is that there are many theories to explain this uh, phenomenon. And abduction researchers, most of whom have never had an encounter themselves, are just really good at coming up with theories. And I'll tell you now, I don't have one. And I'm an abductee, as well as a researcher. The problem with the theories are that none of them cover all the data, and they divide us. 
And we become so entrenched in defending these theories that we put our personal egos and reputations on the line for that it becomes more like religious or holy war activity between the search camps than a, a concerted effort to try to figure out what the data really means. So I have no theory. I'm just going to give you the data. And I'll tell you this. The one thing I can say, and I can only say one thing I know I know. There's some things I think I know. Very few. But the one thing I know I know is that the evidence does show a massive, ongoing, long-term alien involvement with humans, and nobody has a convincing explanation for it yet, especially, not even, and especially the aliens. Four main theories are the four main groups the theories fall into, and I'm just going to name them off, and then as we go through the data, I'm going to present firsthand from the uh, research that we've been doing. You can see how they support or how they don't support these main theory patterns. Number one theory, the ETs, and I use that term loosely, I don't have a clue where they come from. I don't know what they are. I do believe they're finite and fallible, however. I don't think they're gods. So I just use that for shorthand. The ETs, the first theory, says have an objective scientific agenda. The second theory, the ETs have a self-serving agenda. Third, the ETs have a human survival, human-oriented agenda. And fourth, the ETs have a spiritual agenda. These are where the main theories right now have to end up being grouped. Well, so we'll go with those in mind, and you see where the data seems to point for yourself. <coughs> All right, uh, we've got our slides going on here. First, we, we've talked about the first group, the objective scientific agenda. And for each of these categories, there is supportive evidence, and there is contradictory evidence. For instance, oh, well, we're not. For instance, uh, we have reports going back into the 50s of the ETs taking soil samples, plant samples, and so on. Now, if, um, if you remember, if you've done your homework, wait, we're not supposed to be moving, guys. Back there with the slides, okay. This goes back, as I said, early on uh, in the reports of UFO sightings and landing reports. We've seen very many cases of soil samples and plant samples around the world. This one is a drawing from a case I'm working on from the current book dealing with nine different women's experiences around the country. This one occurred within the last two or three years, and it tells us if the aliens are doing objective soil sampling, they're the stupidest creatures warning the planet right now because they've been doing it for 40 years and apparently haven't got it right yet. <laughs> All right, um, I don't have I don't have a lot of slides in. We'll just come in and out of slides if you don't mind. That's all I'm going to be doing for just a second. But you can leave the lights down while I talk, so we'll be getting back to them. We know we have evidence showing that they do studies of the human reproduction system. That's certainly not a surprise. Going back to Betty and Barney Hill, or further if you go to back to Via Voss in um, South America. We do know more recently people are grudgingly admitting in this research that they're also concerned with the study of human psychology as well as the physiology. There are pain and pleasure studies. Obviously, these seem to be along those lines that people have been reporting. And it's very hard to fit that into what are they doing on a scientific and objective agenda if they are treating us no better than animals. Maybe that's what they're doing. We do pain and pleasure studies on animals. Perhaps that's what they're doing with us. But we also have evidence that they study human military capabilities with their inspections and landings and interferences at our military areas. All right, some of the things that, that, that support this possible set of theories. But then there are some things uh, that do not necessarily support it, and we have to think how would these fit in. For instance, some of the body marks that abductees regularly turn up with after encounters. You're very familiar, I'm sure, with the scoop marks, which are supposedly samples uh, taken from us for some particular scientific reason, are the straight line cuts, and we have a variety of explanations for those. But I'll tell you from the work that we have been doing in, in about a five-state area, uh, from Texas, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, Louisiana, Tennessee, Alabama, large in a five-state area. In the case after case count, if you want to keep up with sheer statistics, we have other marks that turn up much more often than the scoops and straight line marks. For instance, bruises and punctures often in certain patterns. Um, what we've come to call the clamp mark, the set of three bruises that seem to be where three fingers or three pronged something has been clamped usually on the thigh or the upper arm of the person as if they had been carried or forcibly held down. And these turn up over and over again. 
Um, what do we have here? Okay, another set. Different set altogether. These are very typical from case to case. We also have what we've, uh, the puncture marks, as if an injection has been given, but very often they will be in double sets. We've come to call these the snake bites, two little punctures close together in various parts of the bite. So these turn up more often in our research that, than do the scoop marks and the straight line marks. We also have the fun of the claw marks. Now what this has to do with a scientific or objective um, experimentation, I can't really tell you. This is my husband's back, by the way. On the night of, or the morning of January 13, 1989, after an encounter where the handling of this, spe this specimen they were coming to examine was a little rough because he didn't want to go. <coughs> there was also a large triangular patch of rash that did not show up in the photograph that wrapped from the backbone up, uh, that was the baseline, around to the front of the stomach and then up, making the apex of the triangle right under the side of his arm. Of his, uh, under his arm. All right. Um, Another set. This is a, the next two pictures are from the same person. This is the upper part of the, the young man's thigh, where there are gashes that are definitely not surgical incisions. And these marks are taken three. Uh, the photos are taken at least three days. It may have been four after the event occurred, so they're already quite on the way to healing. And what you aren't able to see are the large welt lines that were still visible to the eye, but not to the camera that ran from the thigh all the way down to the knee. They were about uh, six or eight of these running down past the V-shaped scratch marks. These were in November of 88. <clears throat> and then we also have what we've come to call a little ET brand, the triangle mark, and they come in a variety of types. Here's one that I had on the morning of November 1st, 1988, a triangle of punctures into the uh, the neck area over a vein area. Uh, triangle bruise patterns also turn up. This one on the back of the calf. This, uh, and, and these lines that you see that uh, are sort of light rays coming out, those are just reflections from the lighting when the slide was taken. They're not really on the body, but you will see the three white balls that make a triangle down toward the bottom of one of those lines permanent mark. A red triangle, again the photos are so much more clear than the slides, I have to apologize. A red triangle mark on my husband's leg, within the red triangle are three white balls. Again, they're much more visible from the actual photograph, but a variety of triangle marks. And this is from a, one of the women whose uh, material will be included in the book I'm working on now down in Central Texas who had a uh, an extraordinary experience where she gained time in an encounter rather than losing it and ended up with oh, probably 18 to or more different marks, bruises, punctures, and scratches and so on the next morning. This is one set of triangle punctures on her back. And because she was afraid they wouldn't show up, she had circled on her body where various marks were. This is only part of her body that next morning. All right. So we, we have to say, what, what are they doing and with that inflicts these sort of marks that would fit into the, any of these agendas? This is what the data looks like when you start looking at the people over and over again. Very few scoop marks, although some of these people do have them, the other marks are much more numerous. All right, um, second set of um, explanations. The ETs have a self-serving agenda, and we hear a lot of variations on this. They're crossbreeding to upgrade their race, I think is the number one uh, mainstream theory right now. They, they range all the way down to uh, using humans as a, an attack of resource, using us for emotional energy, using us for physical uh, fluids that they take from our bodies, even as a food source. All of these fall within the self-serving agenda. But we also have contradictory data where people report to increase psychic abilities after their contacts. We have reports of uh, healings after alien contacts. We have uh, many spiritual uplifting messages that are delivered in some of these contacts. So again, the, the, if you take the whole pot of the data, you're going to have a little trouble fitting it all into one of these very limited categories, and we need to be aware that it's not all as clear-cut as we would be led to think by some. What about the human survival agenda, the third group? We do know that uh, we are told by the aliens many times when they take the sperm and the ova, when they take, implant and remove the, retrieve the fetuses, that they are doing this to help our species survival in some way. And they give us a variety of ways. They can't keep their story straight. Uh, 
um, either we're going, we're becoming um, sterile and won't be able to reproduce ourselves and they're stockpiling for us and in that suite of them. And then we also have the, um, the uh, ominous, uh, the earth's fixing to be destroyed syndrome, or scenario, and we're going to take a few of you off or at least keep some materials so we got something to start back up with when things settle down. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot of different explanations from the ETs themselves. They just don't seem to be talking to each other to keep it straight. But then we have theories and evidence that are not really clear-cut with this. What about the uh, close encounters with the military over the years? What does this have to do with the human survival scenario as the ETs themselves explain it to us? Uh, what about their own self, the possibility that they're the ones meeting the material rather than us, which also has been given as explanations by some of the ETs to some of the abductees. And also, we had it on the other hand of the healings, we also have ET induced illnesses and even deaths from contacts. So again, we've got to question how do we take all of this material and make sense of it? That's our job, but we don't have to have it all before we can do it. All right, the fourth category, ETs with a spiritual agenda. Um, often some of the messages formulate a concept of a battle going on, a battle essentially of good and evil that we're caught up in or we're in the middle of or we have to take sides with or so on. They also give us messages um, that they're aiding us to spiritually ascend to the next level for a variety of reasons and again these vary. We also have the ETs themselves in some cases, not just us, putting our own flavor on an experience, but then telling us they are in fact messengers, our agents of God. They're the workforce for God. And then of course we have a great deal of channel DT information that we can neither confirm, corroborate, or test, but it often is on spiritual lines. All right, this is good. We have this as part of the data. But we also have extremely degradating acts that are also going on in some of the abductions. We have a great deal of unwanted sexual activity, We'll get to that in a little bit. We have uh, really a hard time fitting in where the cattle mutilations work into the spiritual agenda. And we uh, have got to ask questions about what they're doing with us physically that is so pertinent to our spiritual elevation. Uh, do angels need to perform rectal probes? I have trouble with this. <laughs> do three-year-old children have to be engaged in sexual activities in order to be spiritually elevated? Again, these are some problems that I personally have with Recognizing not reconciling any of these theories at this point. <clears throat> now, when we went through and did some um, statistical analysis, very loosely using that term, by the way, on the reports from people that we had not worked with, these are simply reports that came in through the mail, through contacts that wanted to contribute um, their own experiences to the, the data pool. So these are not people with whom we necessarily had personal contact or simply taken information. We came up with certain things that turn up over and over again in the abductee contactee scenario. Um, in America, for instance, people are getting rather excited because as we've noticed through the past few years, when you start looking at ethnic lines or bloodlines, backgrounds, we find that the majority of abductees seem to turn up having Celtic and or Native American blood sources. Well, this may give us a clue if people have built all sorts of theories based on this one thing, but go to China and ask the same question. Go to South America and see. Go to Swaziland and ask and see how much Celtic and Native American blood turns up in the abductees. I don't think we're looking far enough when we start building our theories on partial data. What does seem highly consistent is that if you've got an abductee, you've got a family of abductees. Family members having sightings and encounters is overwhelmingly in the majority of cases, as are the obsessions and compulsions that people go through after their encounters of a variety of sorts along with heightened psychic abilities. You have the other, the low end, or if you want to talk about the, the low tech end, you have a lot of phone interference. People begin to experience after your encounters uh, are conscious, consciously remembered or consciously undergone. Unexplained noises in the house. Um, the 70% or more of the people report this. A much even higher number report electronic disturbances, poltergeist type activity, what they would have called poltergeist type activity if they hadn't been having the encounters to go along with them. Extreme sudden fatigue as if they had been hoovered or backed into every bit of their energy and it's a very short life normally and then they're back to, normal, to a normal energy state. The variety of marks in the bodies that we saw a little bit earlier. 
back problems, and in all the women, almost, uh, I would say, what is 11 sixteenths, whatever that percentage turns out to be, in one particular uh, group of reports we took, the women seem to have abnormal gynecological history, more often than not. And the one thing that everybody on the survey responded yes to was hearing unexplained, mentally or externally heard voices and electronic sounds. Normally their name being called, if they're going to hear voices, and the sounds, uh, anything from a high pitch electronic tone, what people have described as intermittent Morse code beeping. Right, so these things turn up over and over again in the reports. Now, a lot of you are familiar with uh, some abduction material where you think certain things are common and that may be all that's going on. Uh, you have um, the sperm and overtaking, you have the fetus implant and retrieval, you have the hybrid baby presentation, the gynecological exam, and the nose implant. These are things you're probably most familiar with. Well, I gotta tell you, in the survey, when you start looking at the numbers, actually only about 50% of the women report fetus or hybrid baby scenarios, only about half. Only about half report uh, gynecological exams. And when it comes to the implants, we have many more ear implants than nose implants reported, and almost as many eye implants, where the eyes are removed from the socket temporarily and the implant is placed behind it. These turn up together more often than do the nose implants. Very often there are humans involved in these scenarios. Now, I've had some very eminent researchers tell me that, that any time an abductee sees a human on board or in a facility with the aliens, that is a screen. There are no humans there. I don't know how they know this. They're not there to check it out. And the people going through the experiences um, know that there are a lot of screen perceptions going on, but there are some ways, some evidence for many of these cases where the people do seem to be human. And especially this is bolstered by the fact that sometimes abductees themselves, when they are abducted, are put to work in somebody else's abduction scenario. Certainly that person is still a human. Very few people actually report seeing much in the way of symbols or insignia, although we do get reports, but it's not a high number. And physical after effects from these encounters of inside from the bruises, the scratches, the punctures, the noises in the head include also many, many times people say, simply for lack of better terms, say, I woke up feeling beaten. I woke up feeling as if I had dug ditches all night. I woke up uh, as sore as if I'd wrestled gorillas during the night. And they have no, even, even going through these things uh, in the investigations and under hypnosis cannot account for the physical discomforts they are feeling afterwards. We're used to hearing about the, uh, the inflamed eyes and, and so on like that, but more often than not, we get, I felt beat up. All right, different ET types. You're all familiar with the reports. What do we see in the data? Um, typical little grays. And again, one of the cases that will be reported on extensively in the coming book, uh, the woman happens to be an excellent artist, so I've used some of her drawings to stay represent uh, some of the people like me who can't do a stick figure. <laughs> The grades are very commonly reported, and you're probably all familiar with those. There are also, many, and here's another, if you will notice the scenario, this is something that we don't understand what it signifies, but it happens a lot. There will be a group of the little grades, but only one seems to be, in any sense, real or interacting or individual, and the others are almost like shadow puppets or support scenery. They accompany, but they don't do anything. And the woman who drew this, a different case that's going to also be in the book, noted when she first encountered these, only the one whose eyes showed up seemed to have any features. That was with whom she was having the interaction, and the rest were very insignificant. We also have the insectoid. Not, not a fun group necessarily because they are very frightening to look at. In fact, the first ET I ever saw when I was uh, about five and a half years old was like this, only it didn't have the mask over the lower face as it did in this case. And it was very terrifying to see this thing and not know how I had gotten out in the backyard to be with this creature and it telling me it was my mother was very upsetting. <laughs> I thought I knew better. But the insectoid type do differ from the little grays. For instance, as this person's drawing um, can show us a little bit, there seems to be a very bony, high, hard ridge over the eyes. And more often the eyes are round uh, and bulging like fly eyes, if you will, rather than the elongated or almond or smooth, uh, shiny black eyes. 
the, the face in this drawing is covered by a mask of some sort. Now, we've had other cases where the aliens have used masks and said we don't want to frighten them. We don't know why this one was using a mask. It was performing surgical procedures, but normally they're not that tidy about keeping the gloves and the mask on. The body being very, very thin and white, the person who had this experience and drew this was on a table paralyzed with his head pushed very far back, and this is all he could see from his ankle. He couldn't move. Uh, he said the arms tapered to a thickness no more than a broomstick handle. And he was, did his best to, to show the long, thin fingers of the hand, but he said, honestly, from his viewpoint, he could only see a small, thumb-like device and one finger, although he thought there was probably one or two more. He just couldn't see them, so he wouldn't draw it. Then we have the little leathery skin dark creatures with the slit eyes, and I call them reptoid for lack of a better term. They've got reptoid eyes. They seem to have a leathery, dark skin texture. They're often robust reported with webbed uh, appendages, often clawed, and with pretty working, pretty good working teeth. So these are not like little greys or any insectoids. And these seem to be a little rougher and, and more aggressive and are often reported involved in the sexual and disorders that adults report. But these are not all we have. We have the humanoids. Alright, in one of the encounters here, that where you saw the four ETs in front of the big light that looked like the elongated moon. The woman was abducted to a facility that seemed to be underground, seemed to be inhabited by both the ETs and humans, and these three men, there were three men in the encounter dealing with her, appeared to all intents and purposes to be human except for the eyes of the central one, which were reptilian. And the woman had the feeling that the other person may have this man on, on uh, your Left may also have been because she knew he had contact with coverings over his eyes, so he may have been disguising reptoid and slit as well, but everything else looked very human. And then we have the blondes, we have the black haired widow peak humanoids, uh, we have the blue creatures, the dwarfs, and many varieties of reports. And there may be a lot of illusion involved in this, maybe a lot of deception in it, but it's certainly not just one particular type that people are encountering and reporting. And what's, what's, I think, upsetting to the theorists is that we have enough cases where if you look at them, every conceivable combination of ET types is reported working together in a scenario. Blondes with reptoids, reptoids with Winnipeg, insects with all of them, and it's uh, the grays ubiquitously among them. Humanoids, reptoids, insectoids, and grays in every combination you can think of. We also have those that shape shift in front of the abductee's eyes. And I'll talk about this a little bit more if we get some time. I'm trying to rush so we won't keep you here too long. But they change from one feature to another or one form to another. So, not only do we have all of these in the encounters, we also have, and I'll get to this, I, I, I can't resist because it was one of my personal experiences as well as many others, the Jesus figures. And I think it's always funny because Jesus usually turns out being blonde and blue-eyed in these encounters, unlike the real thing probably would have been. They've been looking at the pictures at Woolworths before they make up this time. Okay. Now you've heard about the crossbreeding theories, and they're doing a, to upgrade their race, upgrade our race, whatever. They're doing a hybrid species, and we have a lot of corroborating evidence from the fetal nurseries that many people report. And this is very typical of what people all over the country for a long time have reported seeing. Nurseries where the little jars with the liquids are growing little fetuses in various stages of growth and um, more or less partially human, partially gray looking. And then of course these are followed by the presentation of hybrid looking babies. And uh, they're either try to bond with it or try to feed it or try to hold it or whatever. But they always take the babies back. Now, this is not meant to be overly disturbing to anyone, but uh, along the same lines as having these hybrid fetus nurseries where these wonderful things like the baby presentations take place, we have at least two cases in ours, and this isn't a lot, but it, you, every anomaly has something to teach us, and we should pay attention to the unique items, perhaps even more than the pattern items, because that's where we're going to learn new information. We have at least two cases of women who have been in the nursery, fetal nursery scenarios where they have seen the ET deliberately destroy the fetus in one of the containers and one person said they blended it like a milkshake. And when the woman was aghast and protested vigorously the destruction of this fetus, the, the ET in effect said, what are you getting so upset about? It's not really alive and we're not going to waste any material. It'll all be recycled. So. How do we fit these into the categories? Uh, 
Uh, we're going to try to hold the questions to the end if we can, and it's, so I make sure I get through everything before you all have to sit here forever. We also have a case that I'd really like to have time to report on, and I will in the book. I know we're short on time now, so I won't, but where a fetus was implanted, and then the woman or, miscarried it rather than had a retrieval and was programmed to hide the fetus for its retrieval later by the ETs, and when she had a chance to ask them in a subsequent encounter why they did this to her, they, told, they gave her an excuse for why the baby or the fetus didn't grow, something about beta protoplasm and then said, but we programmed you to hide the fetus. So they knew in advance, obviously, this was not going to be a viable fetal situation. Why would they put her through this? She had been trying for several years desperately to get pregnant. She was thrilled. She was a UFO virgin, if you will. She didn't know that when they come put the fetuses in, they also come and get them. She thought they'd given her a gift. She was going to have that baby she had wanted forever. And she was terribly devastated physically and emotionally by the loss of the fetus. And yet realizing after the second encounter with their explanation, they knew she was going to lose it. They knew they weren't going to use it because it was buried in, the, in a jar of water in the barn. That's where they programmed her to put it. It seemed to me it did not be anything really to do in that case with crossbreeding. Thank you. All right. We have reports of the taking of human physical energy and human emotional energy, sudden collapse and fatigue, sometimes for an entire group in a family, sometimes for one individual from anywhere from 15 minutes to maybe an hour or more. We also have scenarios where the abductee and the ET seem to merge. I've been through this. It's very hard to explain until you felt it, but you understand what I'm talking about. There is a merging of, of the consciousness, uh, the emotions, perceptions, and we don't know what this is all about, except that it does frequently happen that the ET and the person begin to see or feel through each other for some reason in this scenario. And it's always temporary, and it's upsetting sometimes and very enlightening and uplifting other times. We also have scenes of scenarios in the encounter situation where highly emotional, oftentimes disturbing scenarios are made to be relived over and over by the abductee apparently for the purpose of studying either the person's emotional response, or in one case, one woman of Betty, who I will not name, who had a very frightening encounter, and then after the frightening encounter was over, was placed in a chair with a headphone-type device. A little ET sat down in a chair next to him, put on a similar headphone-type device, and the abductee immediately was reliving this terrifying encounter, as if it were really happening, just as if it were real. No sense that this was a repeat. It was happening. And when it was over, he's still sitting in the chair, of course, and the leak, he gets up and another gets in and puts on the hat, and the guy goes through it again. This happens over and over. So maybe it's just virtual reality movie time or something. But the, every scenario felt as real as the first time. High emotional situations in which there's a lot of energy expended in compulsions and obsessions are imposed on abductees after and during these, uh, these ongoing encounters, and they often are very destructive to the person's personal relationships. Uh, job losses occur because of some of these. Families break up over them, and people have even ended up getting arrested because of these. What they mean, that's up to us to try to figure out. But to rule these things out because they don't fit into a neat theory is to overlook what people on the abduction and contact level are really going through. And more disturbing, at least, I think, for the people themselves, as well as for the family and friends around them, are the situations where the ETs actually take over the abductee's body and actions. Sometimes literally unplugging the consciousness of the person so that the person has no memory of any of what goes on during that encounter. But very often, almost cruelly not unplugging the person so that they see what is being done and cannot stop it. Uh, the, uh, we have cases, if we had time, we could talk about, but with 25 minutes and trying to give you time, I will, I'll save that for maybe some private discussions, and certainly it will be part of the material and a couple of the cases we'll be reporting on in the next book. Changes resulting in the person's, abductee's personality values and needs. These turn up time and time again as well, sometimes for the betterment, sometimes for the detriment of the person. <coughs> also reports of abductee doppelgangers. I think we need to pay some attention to cases in which an abductee is reported verifiably by non-abductee people to be in two places at once, which can't be, according to what we understand. And if, you, if one of these situations is not part of the person's memory or experiences, and sometimes these are amusing, sometimes they're very frightening. And I have examples. We'll skip over those right now to get on with the material. Uh, abductee 
Trustees forced into sexual activity, again, we've got to think about what theories might just bolster, what theories might contradict. Sometimes the sex is abductee with ET, or abductee with ET and dildo, if you will. Um, some sort of device that is not part of the ET's anatomy. We have several cases I'd love to be able to go into on this, but I think it's important to keep going that, in fact, we have children who are engaged in sexual manipulations. And I will talk about just one case here because this is, as a parent and a grandparent, very, very uh, important to me that we try to get a handle on why they're doing these things with their children. A woman who was having a, an ongoing series of encounters in Florida was pretty happy with them, had been given some good information. She felt like she was being helped. Uh, she wasn't really being harmed. She was occasionally, well, actually more than occasionally, involved in sexual activity. But as she said, it was some of the best sex she ever had, so what was she going to complain about? <laughs> However, she did begin to complain when one morning she found her five-year-old daughter sexual, sexually molesting her three-year-old daughter. And when she aghast, uh, trying to figure out what was going on, why this five-year-old was doing it, the five-year-old said, but mommy, we're just doing, I'm just doing to her what the little doctors do to us at night. And it wasn't just examinations. And then there are cases where abductees in groups are forced to have sex with each other. Now, I don't know what that may have to do with any of these programs. Maybe it's just entertainment, but certainly doesn't seem to be part of the breeding program because nothing is being retrieved after these sexual encounters. And in many cases, the people are highly, highly um, terrified, humiliated, and not happy about the experience. We also have a growing body of evidence that shows that the ETs are doing clones of human bodies. Sometimes of the individual, the abductee, over and over again, we have abductees who have been shown their new bodies in earth, in storage. One person told it's for the resurrection. This is, you know, Jesus said you get a new body of resurrection. Well, this is it. We're saving it for you. In another case, a man, a, well, a teenager, a young teenager was told, if uh, we can use this body to replace you and nobody will ever know, so you don't want to basically not go along with our program. We can replace you if you don't like what you're doing. And so we get a variety in between those two of the explanation of what the clone bodies are for. Sometimes they're not a copy of the abductee. Sometimes they're simply reproduced numbers of the same body. For instance, 20 or 30 uh, women's bodies in Earth that are all identical, 20 or 30 men's bodies all identical, pretty good looking specimens for the most part, too. What they're doing with cloning, they've got it down now. We need to find out why. And then the reports of uh, humans and ETs working together. Again, things that a lot of the mainstream researchers really don't want to mess with or don't want to get into or try to dismiss as confabulation, fantasy, misperception, or whatever. I'm sorry, the evidence is pretty darn strong on this. Um, for instance, three women in New Mexico abducted a few years back, taken to what appeared to be an underground facility with both human and alien inhabitants doing a variety of what appeared to be scientific activities. One woman was taken to one room where she underwent the typical gynecological and other sort of physical exam. Another woman, the second woman, was also taken to a separate room. We still do not know what happened to her because she couldn't remember consciously and under hypnosis all she did was scream. And the third woman was taken into what appeared to be a computer or equipment type room, large operations room, where she went over, she said, I went over to the dressing area, put on my uniform, which matched those of the ETs, sat down at the computer, punched in my code, and began to work. Had no idea what she was doing, but she was doing it. We also had many reports of abductees in examinations by the ETs where there is at least one human, often female, doctor involved. In some cases, it may be screens. In other cases, it does seem to be directly human. And uh, these are fairly frequent reports. There are more examples, but we'll stop with that. Well, no, I'm not going to stop with that. I'm going to be brave enough to take on an audience that with some highly controversial information because of the corroboration. Case of a man in uh, Louisiana who had an encounter and abduction in 1985 while he was living in Albuquerque. He remembered enough of this to have seen an underground facility, to remember being very, very distraught at what was happening to, he said, our people. <coughs> and remembering having great pity and a heartbreaking sense of empathy for a woman who looked up at him in great misery from what she was doing, but he had he consciously had blocked what was going on that she was doing. Under hypnosis, he saw this as, and this is, a, this is a scenario, and I use that term deliberately. I'm not saying any of these things are objectively, factually happening. They're the scenarios of Duffy's experience. 
whether they're virtual reality movies like over at the Luxor, or whether they're reality itself, it's very, very hard to determine, but the experience for the person is the same, so I just wanted to preface that. He saw what appears to be the processing plant scenario, and this is a facility with both humans and aliens in which human bodies are being processed much like chicken parts at the Tyson factory. And he saw a woman, there were a series of humans who were working on the processing line. They were in fact cutting the bodies up. And he looked into the face of one mature woman who was in, he said, the greatest misery I've ever seen a woman be in. I could tell from her eyes and her expression that she would rather be dead than be doing this, but she had no choice. And we, this was a fairly new to us at the time this came in, into the report, and we just could not believe it at all. This had to be fantasy, tabulation, nightmare, something. This cannot be real, and so we put it in the category scenario. However, a couple of years later, we had a woman from Oklahoma who had had a series of uh, encounter sightings, including the military coming out and taking uh, soil from where the, the craft had landed back when she was 17. She's now a grandmother. Has had things throughout her life. Had a, what was for her a very terrifying experience, and she did want to explore it, but before she even did hypnosis, she said, what I remembered was so bad, I don't know if I can go through hypnosis if there's anything worse. She said, they took me to an underground facility where there were conveyor belt type apparatus with hum dead human bodies coming along them, and they made me dismember them. Again, we said, got to be a scenario, but we don't know if this is real or not. If it's not real, why are they doing it? If it is real, why are they doing it? Pretty much, we got to get down to why these things are put into the abductee's experience data, database, why any of this stuff happens. We also have a great deal of the ET deceptions through who they present to the abductees. Uh, dead relatives are often brought back temporarily for some purpose in the encounter, usually to co uh, coax cooperation from the abductee. Oftentimes, a very beautiful scenario will remain in the person's consciousness from an encounter that something wonderful had happened. Uh, for instance, a woman who was reading, she thought she was reading a beautiful ET book at a podium not unlike this to an audience not unlike you full of, of ETs, and each time she would put her hand on one of the symbols of the beautiful spiritual message would come through, she would relate to the audience, and they were very warm, loving, and appreciative of this. This was what she remembered under the first level of hypnosis. But there was a great discrepancy between her state of mind and her, her mental disposition immediately after this in this beautiful scenario. Um, the regression has programmed her to go past mental blocks, to strip away illusions, to report only the truth of the experience. That's all she said. That was all the programming the person had was report only the truth, strip away the illusions. And what she reported was a very disturbing and upsetting experience where, again, it involved a great deal of physical intrusion in front of a whole group of beings. And the woman, being very religious, was praying to Jesus to take her out of this humiliating situation. And, of course, she was not taken out of it. And this led to the distraught sense of betrayal and loss and humiliation that the woman was experiencing when she was put back into her car when the whole thing was over. We have a lot of use of religious figures to coax cooperation from abductees. Uh, Jesus turns up more often than not, but we also have the Pope, we've had Mary, we've had saints and angels and so on, that obviously, once the scenario begins, are not who these beings purport to be, or at least they don't act like. So we have to see the screens are not just the masking of the onset of encounter. I thought I saw a big gray owl in the window or whatever. There's also masking and illusion and deception going on at many, many stages of these events. And the trouble is finding out how to get past these illusions during the investigation and during the hypnosis to what may be underlying experiences that these things screen. Again, we have uh, quite a few reports, not, not every report certainly, and not as, re not as often as we have the spiritually uplifting reports, but we have these often from the same person. I'm not saying that only one type of experience happens to one abductee. In most cases, abductees have both abductions and contacts with both positive and negative nature that they feel. So this is not bad people have bad things happen, good people have good things happen. The same people have both things happen. Uh, much information coming in on intimidation by the ETs, such as that woman who I just told you about who was praying to Jesus and for, for release from this situation, and the ETs, in fact, she felt taunted and jeered at her faith and jeered at her. A woman in Missouri who was threatened that if 
was shown the processing plant scenario. This is yet another case where bodies were being processed and was told her child would end up here if she did not carry out the instructions and the program the UTs had in mind for her. This has happened more than once. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the young man who was shown the clone of his body and told we'll replace you with this body and nobody will know the difference if you don't do what we want. Uh, children, we've had several cases where abductees as children had their pets threatened. If they told their parents or if they talked about the scenario, their pet would be killed. And this has actually happened in some cases. By the way, I, one thing I totally forgot to mention that I think is extraordinary, you've heard about the fetal implants and then the subsequent retrieval that women report. We do have at least two cases of men who have had this happen, by the way. You can imagine where they may have put it. Um, back to now the ET interest in human souls. We're just going down a list of kinds of data that don't necessarily fit into these theories. We have reports of people having asked having been asked if their souls could be borrowed. We have cases where people have been told their souls have been exchanged with other souls. We have several uh, reports of what was described in the ETs as a soul recycling center, which turned out in both cases that we've been able to investigate to be a huge metallic sphere uh, outside the Earth's immediate environment, but near enough, and to have been, this is where the souls are recycled, and if you go into this, you don't come out of this again the way you went in. Carl, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, I was going to show you, let's see, go ahead and go through the slides. This is one of the underground facilities, uh, of course, of the humans, aliens working together. We had both in this case, and an underground facility where it seems to be scientific. Um, this machine, this woman drew, is called the soul machine. She said they were those circles, it was like a, a little chair and a desk connected. And you sat down to the little chair, and there were different colored light openings, those circles were light openings, and as you passed your hand over each of the different lights, a different musical sound would come out of this, and she was told that was the sound of the soul. And each person's soul played a different song. This is also the person who was shown her clone body and told it was for the resurrection we're saving it for you. Um, the, the intrusions, we've, I don't know why we're getting into this at this point. Maybe I've got things out of order. Though the evidence of human involvement in these cases is also, uh, there's a lot of corroborating evidence for military surveillance, harassment, not just the phone and mail interference, people being followed, ourselves we've been through this, helicopter um, harassment and surveillance. We lived in a house for eight years. The first five years never had a copter over. Once we had the conscious encounters, they began coming almost uh, relentlessly. Is that a cloud? No, that's just a reflection from the light. That's, I said some of these have light reflections on them. Um, the military, and this is one of the, now these two of the cases, actually four of the cases I'll be reporting on the next book have had direct military intervention. This is one from one of the cases who is a good artist who drew an area, an outside area um, near, uh, we don't know where, but she's from Tennessee where she was abducted to along with three other human women. She did not know them in the middle of the night and was, this was a whole campground or a compound scenario with human buildings, military trucks and equipment, people in the military uniforms, both green and black uniforms, where people were being moved between certain buildings for certain uh, processes, and she doesn't remember what happened after she was confronted by um, several of the military officials and given a liquid to drink that was very bitter and passed out. She doesn't know what happened after that, but we've heard that from the ETs too, haven't we? Given the dream and then passing out. And we need to talk about the control. I said earlier that in both the abduction and the contact, the human is not in normal consciousness. He's not allowed to stay in normal consciousness. There's always a control. Normally, we're beginning to think this may come not just through looking my eyes real close, which they often do to us, but through the implants, because they have been, there seems to be information now coming out from some of these very well investigated cases where the implants are not only used for tracking, monitoring, or are communicating, they're also used to control, and that control can be extended as one abductee was told, unto death, if necessary. And um, the ones in the ear, this is one that was removed from a person's ear, and it shattered after it was taken out. We thought this was very unusual until a couple of months later we got a report from another investigator who had an ear implant come out of a child of one of the abductees, and it too shattered when it just sort of disintegrated when it came out used for control, often implanted. Now the new, new place seems to be behind the ear. Not in the ear necessarily, but behind the ear. This is turning up more and more frequently and has possibly been identified, if you can believe anything that comes out of what he's now, as a form of control. 
controlling the all all of the I can't even see from here what part of the brain that is going into, but all of the functions that are controlled by the area of the brain through which this implant would cerebellum cerebellum where it would intrude. Also, implants in the lower neck area or upper spine area are fairly frequently being at least reported, whether or not we can find them on MRIs or X-rays is another matter, because sometimes the material seems to be essentially biological and doesn't show up as any different than our own. And then we've had a couple of cases of these that do show up, and they're in various places, sometimes in the common places, but in this one case, the drawing, uh, the, I don't have the X-ray, it's not in my research files, it's with Barbara's, of the small, thin, metallic rod with little wires coming out the end of it, and these do show up, and they are reported um, Similarly, from case to case, uh, here's another drawing of another case showing where they implanted right behind the ear. And, um, that's all the slides I have if you'd like to turn the lights back on. We also have messages, I won't even get into the underground facility reports any more than we have, but we have messages from the ETs about the future, and these are ranged from the sublime to the hellish and everything in between. Again, the stories are not consistent, warning us against other ETs, warning us against imminent destruction by ourselves, by nature, by uh, other forces, uh, that they're going to rescue certain numbers of people from the planet, and the numbers vary from 40,000 to 1.2 million from case to case. Warning of the battle I talked about, the coming battle of good and evil, and warnings that the human species is being changed in order to make it more useful to the ETs rather than to us, and that we should not accept this passively. And the warning of the make or break situation that all humanity will have to go through. We get these warnings where people are told it won't be a case if you make it and you don't. It'll be you all make it or nobody does. And you won't have a choice about taking the test. It's coming and you're going to have to take it. Good luck. So we have just a variety of very strange data that doesn't normally get reported in the research material, but it's what the people are really experiencing. And if we can't understand where all of this is, then we can't understand where any of it is. So I no theories, just here's some of the rawest data we've had in the last several years. <laughs>